And there's plenty of superb anecdotes about the history of the bite and, and so on. I suppose the earlier question, uh, which if we want to go right back to ground zero, who invented the word bit? A chap at, guess where, Bell Labs, John Chukey. Worked with Shannon and others a bit. I think it was he who, in a paper in 1947, actually uttered the word bit rather than binary digit for the first time. So how big should your groupings of bits be to hold the numbers you were interested in? And this is the key to it all. Early computers were word-based. Later on, the idea of the byte came to be not synonymous, but associated with what's the amount of storage we'd have to set aside for holding a character. But, you know, real programmers aren't bothered with waffly bits of text. You <laughs> want numbers, you know, the obsession with the early computer pioneers was very much we're going to build these things because they're interested in, in their own right electronic general purpose computers but what we really want to do is be able to do serious applied mathematics engineering quantum chemistry computer science x-ray crystallography radio astronomy all good solid scientific things which need guaranteed decimal accuracy so remembering the rule of 3.322 which I don't have on my t-shirt this time, sorry about that. And if anybody wants to produce a t-shirt with that on, I might even buy one. The 3.322 is the multiplying factor for how much more binary circuitry you need in your arithmetic unit of your computer to be able to do things in binary arithmetic rather than decimal arithmetic. The logic bits of the computer, it's a no-brainer, it's yes-no decisions, so proper binary is fine there. But why not use decimal integers? Well, using decimal integers, we can point to the previous video on this, it's fine, but you've got to stabilise 10 different voltages for 10 different levels of decimal digit. You've only got two to stabilize for binary. It's much simpler to build in binary, but you have to accept you will need 3.33 whatever times the amount of binary components to do arithmetic than you would need decimal. Okay, so that's accepted then we build in binary. But for school use, you were taught how to use logs to do your multiplies with four decimal digits of accuracy. Babbage and others wanted at least 10 digit. In fact, I've not got them here at home, but I've got at work. I've actually got 10 digit log tables, quite a big thick book of them. So if 10 digits was deemed to be a pretty decent starting point, multiply by 3.322 and you can see it by the time you got to something like 33, 36 bit for safety, maybe groupings, you're beginning to get the 10 decimal digits of accuracy that you want. So you look at EDSAC, a first generation computer, which we've been talking about. EDSAC's only got an 18 bit word, of which 17 bits are useful. But by the time, if you only glue two of those together in some way, you're up to 35, 36 bits. Now you're talking. That's getting us the accuracy we want. However, at greater expense, of course, contemporaneously, as we now know with EDSAC, it was the EDVAC. They went for 40 bits straight away. So they didn't have to double up the locations. More expensive to build, of course. But 40 bits, fine. That will get you 10 or 12, possibly decimal digits. Even when I came to do my work, uh, early work on quantum chemistry, all along you were aware of not wanting to lose precision on your decimal digit calculations and um, <clears throat> take great care about rounding errors and stuff like this. I once looked <clears throat> at some exam papers for the Cambridge Diploma because for many years from about the early 50s onwards Cambridge did a postgraduate diploma in computing yeah based around the EDSAC you went there a lot of Famous computer scientists converted themselves, if you like, by doing the Cambridge Diploma. An awful lot of those diploma papers were numerical analysis. There was the odd question in there, which was shock horror, non-numerical, covering things like algorithms for the traveling salesman problem. But then the next question would be, you know, how could you invert a household and normal matrix of dimension 20 by 20 in the minimal number of operations without losing 
decimal precision in the fifth decimal point, all this kind of stuff. That was the background. Scientists, mathematicians and engineers built computers and they built them to do hardcore numeric calculations. So was that all that there was to it? No. <clears throat> On the sidelines and treated quite honestly and, and shamefacedly, I say this in many ways, with a bit of derision, was commercial computing. And the company, as I'm sure you all know, that was instrumental in leading the way with that was IBM. IBM for years and years and years was the biggest computer company in the world. It, uh, it's probably in, probably still in the top 10, but I'm guessing that Microsoft, Apple and Google will be bigger than IBM in terms of revenues nowadays. Yeah, IBM, of course, had got the best part of almost a cent, no, half a century, a good half a century of lead in using punched cards as a means of holding data. And even though the machinery that sorted them, collated them, and could even do elementary additions and subtractions on the codes that were on the cards, IBM was the market leader by a mile. Others tried to get in on the act and get a little bit of action, and they did, but the industry leader was IBM. So IBM understood about real data. OK, then, so they were the right people to basically start saying, you look at these computers now and how they handle characters. It's pathetic. And it is, because you can go back to our EDSAC video about how to print high, but it doesn't matter whether you're printing out high or hello world. You look at the way that these early computers did characters, and it was absolutely suboptimal. The story was, well, if you don't want to fill up your word with lots and lots of bits that real scientists use, you could always fill up a subset of your word with maybe 5-bit for a Bordeaux code, or invent your own 6-bit code to stop having to use figure shift or letter shift, turn it from 32 possibilities to 64. So 5, 6-bit characters were common. but. Some people started to say, well, you always go on about memory being so massively expensive and so precious. And yet on EDSAC, you say, well, it's a 5-bit character, so you can economise, can you, by squeezing three 5-bit characters into a 17-bit word? No. Why would you do that? It would be hell to get them out again. You'd have to do bit shifts and all sorts. You'd slow things down. So when you look on an early machine like EDSAC, it uses 5-bit characters in the middle of an 18-bit word, and the rest of the 13 bits just don't do anything. IBM came along and said, look, here's the story. For those of you who've got lots of money and don't mind spending it, we have the perfect solution. Stop making the word be your minimum addressable unit. Address the characters inside it individually. And in order to keep things clean and to allow for future expansion, don't mess about with multiples of two, like six bit characters. Let's be brave and say, right, eight bit characters. Now, along for a while before all this came about, people had been calling groups of bits of arbitrary size, five bits, six bits, we've been calling them bytes. But IBM proposed to standardize on the word byte being an eight bit entity. And here's the win-win situation. For those of you mad mathematicians and engineers, we can arrange the hardware to reg regard groups of four of those as being a 32 bit word. It's a win-win. IBM can dominate not only commercial computing, but can also make a reasonably good showing because of the sheer speed of their hardware, at great expense, in scientific computing as well. So people said, oh, great idea. Oh, wow, yes, that is, you know, now that we've all got more money and can afford more expensive things, that is a sensible way to do it, without a doubt. So the idea was absolutely spot on. You choose a byte width, which is a power of two, um, and then you arrange to be able to put together groupings of bytes that form something sensible and bigger for macho types who want to do real number arithmetic. So everything in the garden is lovely. You've got 32 bits, you've got 8 bits. It was almost end of story, but not quite, because although IBM did very nicely with their 
things like the 37195 and so on, at being a pretty good mainstream scientific computer, they didn't really go for chasing the market at the very top end because there just wasn't enough in it for them. They made megabucks off their commercial database customers. So right at the top end, you get uh, alternative solutions emerging, which are still with us today. It started off with a company called CDC and a brilliant hardware engineer called Seymour Cray. And ears will say, Cray? He left CDC eventually, yeah, he did, and formed Cray Computers. So yes, at the supercomputer end of things, there was an alternative market, but IBM, solidly there in the middle, said, we do commercial and we do scientific, we rule the world. And I think they were remarkably prescient and they, even at the other end, foresaw it and tried to get it right but failed. But maybe this will have to be another video because it does complete the story, is what about people who wanted something even cheaper than a 16-bit PDP-11? They wanted an 8-bit micro. IBM saw that coming and tried to get in there and dominate it, but for reasons we half understand, but can be revealed if there's enough demand. They did lose control of that one. A particular piece of data, you have to wait for it to come round again. So that tape that you see there is going at 5,000 characters per second. Let's get over there and have a look. Yep. 5,000 characters per second, roughly, I think, corresponds to 30 miles an hour.